composer Igor Stravinsky composed a piece of music that had a violin solo written within that that was so very difficult that the first musician who was to play that piece in public practiced and practiced and practiced and then said, I can't do this. This is too hard. This is actually unplayable for me to be played as Stravinsky wrote it. And so with probably fear and trembling, that person went to Igor Stravinsky and actually said, I'm sorry, this is very hard and I just can't play this the way that is written. I cannot play it perfectly. And was probably expecting that he would be scolded. Instead, the great composer said, that's exactly what I expected. What I was looking for was the sound of someone attempting to play this piece of music on the violin. There's a very similar story that Bill Clancy included in his book, Church, Why Bother? And it involves music and Christian witness. He said that there was a town in California which was well known for its reputation of being very culturally unsophisticated. And in that town where they were known to be very culturally unsophisticated, there was a band director at the high school who received a great deal of criticism. And the reason that he received all of this criticism was because every single year for the concert of the band, he had that group of student musicians play Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. And every year the results were terrible. It was absolutely considered an awful presentation year after year. And so there were many critics who said that it was wrong for the band director to do this, that he should not have expected those student musicians to play that piece publicly, which many professional musicians find challenging. And yet on the other hand, he had people who supported him. People who said, you have to realize that in that audience, every year at that concert, there are many people who in no other situation would hear music by the great composer Beethoven. So brothers and sisters, I'm here today to say it's very clear. <laughs> I am very well aware that my Christian witness is far from perfect, absolutely so far from perfect in so many ways. And yet I have to continue to be inspired by that kind of advice that they gave the band director, those in support of him, by saying, I have to think that in all kinds of situations in my daily life, there may be many people who in no other situation would hear of the good news of the gospel message of Jesus Christ unless I share it with them, however imperfect my sharing may be. For brothers and sisters, each and every day I'm sure we encounter people who if we do not share that message with them, they may never hear of the great love of God our Heavenly Father, the grace of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ, and of living in fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And so we persevere and enjoy, share that good news. Will you please pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you. For you, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I was so excited to hear about your upcoming movie night because I love movies. And of the many movies that I have seen, some of them, you know, I probably forgot rather quickly after I saw them. And there were others that have stayed with me. Maybe not the entire movie, but bits and pieces.
pieces of them. And some of them have lasted in my memory for many years. And one of those is a movie that was several years ago actually marketed for children. And even before I went to see it, I just felt that I was going to love it because I loved saying the name. It was called Mr. Memoriam's Wonder Emporium. And the whole week before we went to see it, I would tell everybody, I'm going to go see Mr. Memoriam's Wonder Emporium because it was just so much fun to say. And I thought, I'm going to love this because if the name of a movie is that much fun, the movie has to be great. And I did love many things about the movie. The movie is about the Emporium a magnificent toy store where all of the toys and even the store itself come to life. There are amazing things that go on there. There are lighted toys that just fly zigzagging through the air. And underneath those toys, there are stuffed animals that reach out their little plush arms, wanting somebody to hug them and take them home. And there are balls that bounce by themselves. And it's a strange and wonderful and amazing place, that emporium. But the key to it is, in order to see it, you have to believe it. Brothers and sisters, in order to see those wonders, you have to believe. And so in this emporium, there was a lot going on, and it was all because of the master toy maker, Mr. Memoriam, who was reputed to be 243 years old. And he had Mahoney, who was his manager of the store. And she was a wonderful and talented and intelligent, capable young woman who faced the world with a smile, typically. The problem was she lost her confidence. Whenever Mr. Memoriam would say to her, Mahoney, it's time for you to take over. You need to take over the Emporium completely, all by yourself. And she became frightened and lacked the confidence and unsure of herself, and she would always say no. And so the, the conflict which pushes the plot of the movie along is that tension between Mr. Memoriam saying to Mahoney in ever-increasingly creative ways, you need to take over and do this, and her each time saying, no, I can't do this. Until for me, the best part of the movie is when she has said no one more time to his even greater and greater creative ways of asking her to take over and do something that she didn't feel she could. And he looks at her in a wonderfully loving and fatherly way, and he says to her, your life is an occasion. Rise to it. Brothers and sisters, our lives are occasions. And I just feel as if God is asking us to rise to the occasion. Think about in scripture, all of these situations where there's like, picture Moses in his bare feet, standing beside a bush that is burning yet not consumed, and God is calling him to rise to the occasion. And brothers and sisters, in what I heard today, I hear it, I'm so encouraged by you rising to the occasion to share the good news of God's love with folks. It's wonderful, for God does continue to call us to rise to the occasion. And today's scripture lesson from the Old Testament is one of those situations that I think of in strange and wonderful circumstances, God asking someone to rise to the occasion. Please hear today Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of 
their voices. The doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. But he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. It's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, the Holy Commission of Isaiah took place at a time of international unrest. And it also took place in a vision, a strange and wonderful vision, which was filled with just amazing things going on. There were amazing things to see. Creatures with six wings and all that was going on was strange and odd, as Isaiah would have seen that, as we picture it. But there was also an auditory element to that, where there was the heavenly host singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. And this is where worship begins. It begins with God's holiness. The holiness of God is something that we can't attain. The holiness of God is something we do not control. And during this lifetime, it's largely mystery to us. And yet we believe and know and trust in our holy God. And it is there that worship begins. And yet in his holiness, God does not remain separate from us, but reaches out to us in love. And we come together in personal relationship with him. Now in the presence of God and his holiness, Isaiah cried out, Woe is me! I am sinful and I, I live among people who are sinful. But he wasn't left in that condition. Notice that that live coal was brought and he was cleansed. And then he was ready to move on. To go and do what God called him to do. Think about how we may be called to serve God in a similar manner. In his book, It's a Great Day in the Kingdom, Dr. Richard Morland, retired dean of chapel at Grove City College, wrote that there are four simple words that can remind us and keep us aware that we may be called by God in a pattern very similar to the way Isaiah was called in that vision. And the words are show, woe, glow, and go. First, when God wants to get our attention, there'll be a show. Something that will show us that God is tapping us on the shoulder, that God wants to call us to something. It may not be uh, quite as unusual as Isaiah's vision, but there will be something that will be clearly meant for us to notice. It may be something that we see in nature, something we've never seen before, something we've seen before many times but have never looked at in that perspective. Or it might be something that's a circumstance in our lives, a way situations come together, or something someone says or something someone does. It will be clear to us that God is speaking to us, but it will be different in all situations and perfect according to God's perfect choice for us. And so there will be this show. And in the presence of a show of God calling us to do something, what we're likely going to feel is, whoa, that overwhelming sense of, of humility. I am being called by God Almighty to do something brings us to humility. And just like Isaiah, that's the way that we come to the most sincere confession of all. It's not in the presence of what others might have as a to 
to-do list for us. Or others might say we are to do or should do, but it's in God's presence and according to God's standard for our lives. It is God who sets the standards for our lives and it is holding our lives against his standard for us and his call for us that our truest confession comes. And then after we have confessed, we very quickly know that like Isaiah, who was immediately cleansed, we are cleansed as well immediately with our sincere confession. By the blood of Jesus Christ, we are saved. We are forgiven. <coughs> and then, that gives us that glow. Not the glow of a live coal like in Isaiah's vision, but the glow of the joy, the joy that is in our hearts and the smiles that will be on our faces as we know that forgiveness. We know that joy of loving God through Jesus Christ. And then we will feel restless until we are ready to say yes and go. To go and to serve him in whatever way God has called us to do. There is someone whose life has been an inspiration to me, and she followed, I believe, that particular pattern in her life that Isaiah's life and his vision were based on. This was Gladys Aylward, who was born near the turn of the 20th century in England. She was orphaned while she was very young. And as a young woman, she became a domestic. And as a result of going to a revival services to hear the gospel message preached, Gladys felt a very strong and specific call to Christian mission work. She felt very strongly that she was being called to China to share the good news of the gospel there. And yet, when she shared this call with others, um, they were not so supportive, and she did not have the funding to do this on her own. And so it was an uphill battle for some time where she sought to get the support of others, to just encourage her, and also to provide monetary support so that she could travel. But this was accomplished. And when Gladys was in China, it was amazing the show of God working there <laughs> in the lives of the people she encountered. For first of all, there were doors opened that she could never have opened herself. Doors opened where she was able to share the news of Jesus Christ and his love for the people of China. And not only was it that the door was open and she could share, but the show involved that there were people in large numbers who were also accepting Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. And so there was this magnificent show, but it wasn't always easy. In fact, the country was at war at the time, and Gladys found that she was in charge of a large number of orphaned children. And she realized that where they were was extremely dangerous. And in order to save these children, she had to get them out of war from in Yangcheng. And so, she, with only one other adult, took 100 orphaned children on foot across the country at war to save them. While she knew it would be difficult, it turned out in actuality to be much more difficult than she ever could have dreamed. It was dangerous, it was tiring in so many ways. And at one point, she felt that very strong feeling of woe, humility. She thought she had taken on too much, and she could not take one more step. And she sat down and said so. While she was feeling that woe, a young girl came to her. And that young girl was still, despite how tiring the journey was, was still enthusiastic and encouraging. And she started to talk to Gladys and actually minister to her by saying, what you're doing is you're like Moses. You're like Moses leading the people to the promised land. But Gladys wasn't feeling it at that time. And she said, but I am not Moses. And the little girl looked at her and puzzled away and said, No, you're not Moses, but 
Jehovah is still God. Imagine the glow that she felt then. The joy of knowing that despite her limitations and that her leading of those children and her witness was not perfect, Jehovah was still God. And in his strength and his power, she could continue. And she was at that point ready to go. And go they did. And everyone in that group arrived safely at their destination. Brothers and sisters, you and I are not Moses. But Jehovah always was, is now, and always will be God. And our lives are occasions, occasions to serve Him. May we rise to the occasion in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We you please pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, worship, we thank you so much that there are so many brothers and sisters here who are faithful to your call, who are reaching out and sharing their time, their talent, their treasure with others in your name. We thank you for that and we thank you for the difference that that is making in so many lives. We thank you, dear Father, that we have the joys of sharing together here today we have the joy of those celebrating many milestones in life, and love and anniversary of birthdays upcoming, and the joy of the fellowship here and all that is good. We thank you, dear Father. And we just pray that in the days and weeks and months and years to come, we be faithful to you, and that we are aware and open to that time when you may tap us on the shoulder, dear Father. You may show us that you are calling us. And although we will feel humble by that, we, we know that we are being called not because we have a perfect witness, but because we serve you. And you are perfect, dear God. And that we will just flow in that joy and be ready to go and to be sent. May we rise to the occasion and serve you here, within these walls, and out in the world. In the name of Jesus, amen.